Hey, what's going on folks? It's Mike here and welcome to this next lesson in our C++ series. In this lesson, we're going to be revisiting something that we've seen before, and that is const. But this time we're going to take a look at it in the context of a class. So let's go ahead and dive in. So we've already seen const used in a few different contexts here. So for instance, if I have some variable here like my number and I say it equals some number here, I'm able to mutate or change this number in any way that I like if I go ahead and type something out like this here. So I'll go ahead and just compile this and I'll run it and we can see that we're able to mutate or change this value here as we like. Now, if we don't want that, we can go ahead and qualify our type as const. And again, this makes it immutable. So go ahead and compile and we can already see that we have my number here is not allowed to change. So it makes it a read only or immutable variable here. So that's the first use case of const here. So for const, we've got one here, read only, or sometimes you'll see immutable variables. And we can also qualify our variables as we pass them into functions. So for instance, let's go ahead and write a function here called set value. And maybe you have some number here that you want to change to. And if you say number equals 72 or whatever here. Now, for whatever, whatever reason you want, when you pass in some value here, you might not want it to change. So you can make this const here. So let's go ahead and try to compile this. And let's see if this works here. So if I even try to compile this, this function is going to fail because it says, well, I'm trying to change this read only variable here and reassign it to some new value. So again, if you're passing values into this function, you want to ensure that they're not something that's going to change. And that can work in different contexts. So for instance, let me go ahead and just um, use this set value function here and pass in my number. And if I go ahead and try to compile this, this works because I'm passing in a const float here into my function. And even if I go ahead and just make this a float, well, let's go ahead and see what happens. Well, I'll go ahead and give this a compile and still works. It's just that the thing when the copy that is made, when we pass by value, again, a little bit of review here, cannot change here. So I just can never set number equal to, you know, one, two, three, uh, or whatever. Okay, so again, um, we will get uh, an error here. And let me oh, make sure that I save here, recompile, and there's our error message. <laughs> All right, so that is our second use of const here. Uh, read only parameters. And this larger idea is that as I'm using const, it's leaving behind clues to somebody who's using my code or Otherwise, if they've architected the code, how this should be implemented. And this larger idea is something known as const correctness. This idea that we want some values to be able to be changed and some not. Now, there is a third use, which we're going to talk about continuing our discussion of classes. So allow me to go ahead and just clear up the screen here. And let's go ahead and look at a class that I have created called user defined type. That's just right here. And we've got our constructor, our destructor, maybe our copy uh, constructor. And if you want following the rule of five, you could, for instance, implement your move constructor, move assignment, copy assignment operator, et cetera, et cetera, as you've been learning from this series. So let's just go ahead and dive into this though and see the next use of const. Now, of course, here's one use case of where you use const as a read-only parameter, like we just discussed here with our copy constructor. You don't want to be able to change the thing as its copy is being constructed. Again, that would sort of be like somebody giving you a blueprint for a house, and as you're building the house, the architect keeps changing the blueprint. You wouldn't want that to happen. So again, that's one of the use cases here. But what about some of the other things here? What are we really protecting in a class? Well, where's the data? These are our actual member variables here. Now, in a way, we get one sort of protection here. If I, for instance, create a user-defined type here, u, and I try to change my size, for instance, here. So this is just an integer. And when I try to compile this example, this one doesn't work because, well, the variable is declared as private. That's this idea, again, we've learned about previously of encapsulating or hiding information in a class here. So that's one way that we can prevent information from being changed or the state within the side of the class. 
but eventually we might want to modify this value here, size for instance. So let's go ahead and write some function here. So set, um, let's just make this a little bit more generic here, maybe value for instance. So set value, um, set the new value, and our member variable um, value will now equal this new value here, okay? So let's just go ahead and um, try to recompile this. Again, I'll get rid of this, call our function set value, and maybe we want it to be 100 um, or something like that, okay? So this compiles, this works reasonably. We've learned about member functions and we're able to modify this. And we probably want some output so that we can actually return this uh, value here. So let's write another function here that's going to get our value. And there's no arguments here. We're just going to return something return m value here. Okay, so let's go ahead and extend this just a little bit so you can see everything on the screen. And let's go ahead and call u.getValue. And let's do a printout here. And we'll just do an end line here for our program. I'll recompile this, rerun it, and we can see the value that is being printed out. So pretty self-explanatory here. But where does the const come in? Okay, so this is the third use case of const for correctness. Let's say that I'm modifying this particular code here, and I want to do something more interesting. Uh, git and compute value here, okay? Maybe there's multiple steps here. Again, this might be a code smell uh, doing sort of two things at once, <laughs> but um, let's just say at some point in our program, actually, let me make this um, let me make this two functions here just so we follow a sort of best practice here. Let's let's say I have compute uh, value. Okay, maybe you have some data collection that you want to uh, iterate through and do some computation. And maybe I have some, you know, for loop here that's, you know, looking through all the values, i less than, you know, however many values you have and so on. But along the way, I accidentally set m value to 10. Maybe it was an IntelliSense error. Maybe I just didn't understand this code base and I thought that I could change m value. And then somewhere in our get value, we always have to call compute value first. And let's go ahead and run this program here. So I'll go ahead and recompile, rerun. And you say, well, if I'm just logically reading through this code here, I just have a set value function here. And then I'm trying to get the value, but it's mutated. The state has actually changed. And if I actually look at get value, what it's doing or what it's supposed to be doing, maybe I read the comments, for instance, and it just says returns m value. Well, again, there's a problem here. There's been some side effect or mutation. We have written a new value for m value somewhere here. So how do we fix this? Well, what I do is I mark this member function as const here. And now if I go ahead and compile this, well, now we can see that anywhere within this function, I'm not allowed to change the state of m value here, even if I'm doing that in some other function elsewhere. So this is where I can really provide some value to my actual code base by using this idea of const correctness and saying, hey, state definitely couldn't change here in get value. And the reason you might want to do this type of thing is if you have, for instance, uh, multiple threaded code here where you don't want threads overwriting different values, um, where you have different state changes, or just as simple as this example here where I'm leaving a code, uh, a clue to other programmers that get value really has a simple job and shouldn't be doing other stuff where you're mutating any of the member variables here. Okay, so let's go ahead and fix this so I can simply just not be changing the state here. Um, or I also have to mark this function as const um, to ensure that nothing's being changed. And now I can actually run this program and I get something that's more consistent or desirable with what I have shown here. The actual proper behavior where I'm just returning a value and not modifying anything. So by putting const after our function and any parameters that we have is our third use of const correctness. So making all of the member variables in a member function read only. Again, meaning that no side effects can happen, no changes, no mutations to any of these uh, member variables here like m value. 
All right, folks, so that's it for this lesson on Kant's correctness, and I hope it's been useful for you to see how this can really improve your code when it comes to catching errors at runtime or even compile time just to see what's going on here. And oftentimes these decisions are made up front. So you don't want to, for instance, cast away cons, which is something that you can do without really, really thinking about it. In fact, I can't think of many good use cases and I'm not even showing you how <laughs> so that you uh, maybe avoid doing that. Because oftentimes when you have cons, somebody's thought about it and why some particular piece of code should really be read only. So folks, I hope this was useful. I hope you enjoyed this lesson here, and this wraps up sort of the const correctness of the three common uses on variables, just local variables, parameters, and use in member functions so you can write better code. If this series has been helping you write better code, make sure to give this video a like, subscribe so you don't miss other ones, and engage in the community and ask questions, and I'll look forward to seeing you in the comments. All right, folks, take care. We'll see you soon.